Good afternoon, everybody. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country through Australia and their connections to land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extended, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. Thank you to Westmead Institute Medical Research and Access News Australia for arranging this very informative session today. We have assembled a panel of world-recognised experts to examine issues surrounding, to adapting to life with COVID, and to bring a sense of learning and to explore changes contextually around COVID conversation. We will hear scientifically factual information on COVID with expert perspective from business, mental health, migrant communities and cyber security. This session will examine the pandemic in the context of lessons learnt and future trends. I'd like to start today by introducing our six guests. In the interest of time, we have kept these introductions brief. Their extended resumes will be posted at the end of this video. I would like, before I commence that, to confirm that today's session is being recorded and will be posted for permanent viewing on Access and Westmead Institute for Medical Research platforms. In the interest of time, we will try and keep this brief in terms of their CVs. Dr. Brian, uh, Ryan, uh, Brendan Ryan, Chief Economist for KPMG Australia and Lead Partner for KPMG Economics Practice. He is also an adjunct professor at Queen's Mary University of London in the School of Economics and Finance. Welcome, Brendan. Maria Betts, Managing Director of Inside Intelligence and the architect and designer of solutions in corporate investigations, human intelligence and surveillance techniques for governance and corporate sectors. Welcome, Mario. Professor Richard Bryant, scientific Professor of Psychology at the University of New South Wales and Director of New South Wales Traumatic Stress Clinic and is the world leading authority in relation to early psychological responses to trauma. Welcome, Professor. Melissa Montero, CEO of the Community Migrant Resource Centre. She has fostered over 200 collaborations and partnerships through staff that she has led and advocate on behalf of vulnerable client groups representing their interests at all levels of government. To you too, Melissa, welcome. Thank Professor you, Professor Tony Cunningham, an infectious disease physician, clinical virologist and scientist, internationally renowned for his research, particularly relating to HIV and herpes viruses. Tony originally started and commenced and founded Westmead Research, Medical Research Institute. Professor Sarah Palmer, co-director of the Centre for Virus Research at Westmead Medical Research Institute and a professor in the facility of medicine and health, the University of Sydney School of Medicine. She is well, world-renowned HIV researcher. To both of you, a very warm welcome. In the next 90 minutes, we want to explore a wide range of issues, challenges and discussion concerning COVID. Mm -hmm. Its vulnerability to supply chains, whether it be agriculture, business, impact, and particularly, say, fuel supplies, looking at areas, financial metrics, consumption, GDP, education, the physical distances of measures and the psychology associated with the social well-being of people, just to name a few, to look at the impact of the balance of payments and the impact that that's having on our standards of living. And through all of that, we want to have a look at security. How is that taking place? And what is that doing to the world in which we live? It certainly is a moment of challenging times. Professor Tony Cunningham, I'm going to shoot to you first because I, I, I want to start with the perspective of the medical aspects associated. And I'm going to, after that, ask uh, uh, Professor Sarah Palmer to add to your, to your comments and discussions and reflections. What are the specific challenges, and, and I mean this from the point of view, how has vaccines worked and to protect us and those around us and the risks associated with vaccines? Uh, Tony, how do they work, vaccines, really, is the question. 
So just say something about coronaviruses first, uh, Jim, to explain it, and that is that um, we do have coronaviruses that cause the common cold, and we've had a coronavirus in the past called SARS that causes pneumonia. This is a combination of both. And so the coronavirus in the, in the nose is responsible for spread, uh, and that's where uh, large amounts of virus are generated. And then in the lung, this is where the coronavirus causes disease in vulnerable people, and they're the ageing and the people who have immune suppression. So when we develop vaccines, they're first aimed at preventing disease, at preventing the uh, disease in these vulnerable people, the ageing, uh, and that's why um, the, uh, the direction of the vaccine in Australia has been uh, as it has. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the protection against disease, severe disease and death has been outstanding from the new vaccines and the ones we've got, the Pfizer vaccine and AstraZeneca, you know, in excess of 95%, even in people who are aged and very aged in their 90s and vulnerable. Uh, against Delta, it's a little less than the previous strains, but still extremely good and exceeds 90%. As you come down the spectrum towards all disease and asymptomatic infection, the protection is a little less. When we inject the vaccine into the muscle of the shoulder, the vaccine flows into the lymph gland under the arm, and there it produces two things. It produces an antibody, which circulates and stops the virus from binding to cells, and it produces white cells, which help us uh, protect against older people and also determine duration. So we need these two arms of the immune response, Jim. Tony, thanks for that, that, that very uh, well-structured uh, overview of looking at vaccines. Can, can I just walk a little bit further down there? We, we, there's a historical development for those who are very ignorant, if you like, in the nicest way to the whole medical world. We talked about SARS, now we're talking about Delta. But what are we really talking about? We seem to throw terms around or medical concepts that assumes we understand, all of us understand. What, what are we really talking about? I'll let Sarah say a little more about Delta in a minute. But uh, if we remember that uh, we've seen um, these uh, mutations in viruses before. Influenza is a perfect example. We get new variants of influenza every few years, uh, and this is what's happening with uh, uh, this particular coronavirus that causes COVID. So we started off with an original strain in Wuhan, and then that changed to the Alpha strain in the UK, which took over most of the UK. And then this, the most spreadable virus is Delta. And the reason it's so spreadable is that it grabs hold like a key in a lock. The first, um, the first uh, uh, variant uh, was a bit loose in the lock. This one is very tight in the lock. And so you get a thousand fold more virus in the, in the nose. And that's why it's so spreadable uh, to uh, other people. So the variants we've had are Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and now Delta. And we undoubtedly will see others. Tony, thank you for also explaining why and where we get that uh, that jab, to use the term that, that most people use. That was very useful and also explained uh, why, why we get into that arm. Westmead Institute for Medical Research is developing a COVID vaccine. Can you tell us about that and how is it going to be different, if any, with regards to uh, what is in the market and uh, what is being uh, provided at the minute? Sure. Sarah and I are co-leading this uh, development and uh, we uh, have been focusing on the white cell component of the immune response. Uh, why are we doing that? Because of uh, uh, our experience, and my experience in particular with vaccines in older people, where you need the white cells to support antibodies. And uh, these white cells also determine memory. And so we've devised fragments of the coronavirus, and Sarah 
uh, may want to chip in and say something about this. Fragments of this coronavirus that avoids these variants and also avoids, uh, uh, to some degree, cross-reaction with existing... As the company went into a dead so it's a, it's a vaccine and it fits with the plans uh, that uh, others have to develop boosters. We're trying to develop a booster that doesn't require changing every time a new variant comes along. It can be used for just simply uh, all variants because uh, where we're getting the fragments of the uh, virus from is not where the variants change. Sarah, I you... could, if I can just jump in. So yeah. how we pick these fragments is we pick the parts of the proteins of the virus that are absolutely needed for that protein to function. So we pick these parts of the proteins of the virus and because they're so important for that protein to function, they don't change, they don't mutate. And so by using these fragments, we can actually develop a vaccine that will avoid new, uh, will, will be effective against uh, new mutations that the virus may take on board. Um, Professor Palmer, thank you, Sarah, for, for, for adding to that. And we're going to look at a little bit more in depth in the moment with regards to Delta. Uh, Tony, I, I want to come back to you. I'm going to ask you a, 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 a what I think is an objective question, and can I just say welcome to our hundred and over a hundred uh, uh, participants uh, listening? I hope you're finding this interesting and enjoyable as much as all we are. Tony, and it's a very difficult question, uh, but I know you have a view. Should vaccinations be compulsory? Well, they haven't been in the past, and one of the reasons they haven't been is because they're likely to invoke a reaction from people who don't want to be immunised or even uh, uh, hesitant about taking the vaccine up. And we know from the past that 5% of people will absolutely refuse to take a vaccine. The latest surveys in Australia put that at about 7%. And yet we've got measles immunisation at 92, 93% in the community, which is great. Now, there's an extra 10 to 15 percent of people who are a bit scared about vaccines and certainly will be scared off by some of the publicity surrounding AstraZeneca. And I keep saying that the risk of uh, getting a, a side effect to AstraZeneca is one person sitting in a full Sydney cricket ground and the risk of dying from it is one in a million, which is the equivalent of lightning strike. And yet if you're a 70-year-old, uh, then your chances of dying of COVID if you get it uh, in Delta are five times that of the average. So you, you can be up around 10 to 15% chance of dying of COVID if you're over the age of 70. So if I took my druthers, I'd be uh, getting the vaccine uh, because one in a million just doesn't compare with uh, uh, 10 to 15%. Now, should it be mandatory? Things are changing. This is an incredibly infectious virus. It's uh, Delta. It's infecting people who are young. Uh, we've got young people in our ICU. We know that no one uh, out of the 85 people in our ICU uh, is fully immunised. So um, if you get fully immunised, again, uh, the real world data tells you that your chances of dying are incredibly small. So immunisation is of critical importance. It also almost certainly will reduce the spread of the virus, it doesn't completely eliminate asymptomatic infection, as I said. So if you're going to, um, if you're going to actually mandate uh, uh, immunisation, You've got a duty of care, and we've discussed this in our institute and our four institute directors working together have appropriately said, well, if you are not willing to get immunised, then you should work at home. doesn't mean you'll be sacked or anything like that, but we've got a duty of care to the people in the buildings that we deal with. Um, why mandatory immunisation is uh, immunizations not be made mandatory for aged care workers earlier than it has and for healthcare workers uh, is beyond me because we've seen um, uh, people die because of uninfected, unvaccinated, infected people coming into both those settings. 
Now, I heard this morning a discussion, I think it was the Business Council, where, in fact, legal opinions have been passed that the duty of care may exceed that of uh, the right to refuse immunisation. Um, it would require, I think, uh, uh, much more discussion about indemnity in the future uh, for uh, business people who, who do this. But my own opinion is that uh, if you're in an indoor situation where Delta is likely to be spread, then immunisation should be mandatory to come into that workplace. Tony, thank you for that reflection and, and that very professional approach to a very complex uh, area. Can I, can I just extrapolate from that? When we say vaccination in a general sense, are you also saying uh, children or adolescents? D does, that, does that move across all age cohorts? I think we're going to need to immunise adolescents. Uh, the spread is clearly occurring in that group and it's even occurring in children. And uh, we need to be, people have been cautious about this because we haven't been mm. sure that uh, children will uh, develop disease, including long COVID, uh, to the same way as, um, as adults. But uh, it's clear that spread is occurring in that setting and uh, uh, we'll need to watch this space. But uh, I would be very surprised if we don't end up immunizing pretty quickly, everybody from at least 12 upwards, and I, I think ultimately people under that age. Tony, thank you for, for your presentation in terms of uh, uh, the contribution you've made to this uh, uh, topic uh, today. Professor Sarah Palmer, good morning. Morning. <laughs> Can you give our, our audience and ourselves a perspective with regards to the global overview of Delta? Uh, oh. It's really an important part for us to understand. Sure. So as Tony mentioned, it's really um, viruses adapt. Uh, and the reason they adapt and change is, is actually give them some sort of advantage. And so the original virus that emerged out of Wuhan was infectious and highly infectious. But the Delta variant has adopted new mutations and changes so that it is now 30 to 60 percent more infectious than the original um, virus that, came, that emerged from Wuhan. And as Tony said, when someone becomes infected with the Delta variant, it causes a thousand fold more shedding of viral particles um, from your upper respiratory area. So in other words, it's extremely it, causes, it allows you to be much more infectious once you are infected with this Delta variant. So what is happening? So this Delta variant, because it is so infectious, is driving new waves of infection globally. And if we look to Asia, the epicenter of these new infections from the Delta variant is located in Indonesia. And currently, Indonesia is, is experiencing a spike of Delta variant infections to 20,000 new cases of infections per day. And this is leading to a very high death rate of 1,000, over 1,000 deaths per day. And they're also experiencing over uh, about 50, 150 children dying per day in Indonesia. And one of the reasons that Indonesia is experiencing such a very um, uh, devastating uh, infection from or uh, high levels of infection from the Delta variant is because only 11% of the population is fully vaccinated. So that really does tell us that vaccines are, are key. But if we also look at other countries, such as the United States, the United States is also experiencing a surge in Delta variant infections. In fact, 90% of new infections in the United States are caused by the Delta variant. And the reason for this is because they have unequal distribution of vaccination across the country. For example, if you look in the northeast of the United States, in a state such as Vermont, there's 67% of the population is vaccinated. But if you look in a southern states such as Alabama, only 36% of the population is vaccinated. And so this virus is attacking those who are vulnerable and those who are vulnerable are those who are unvaccinated. Also, the hospitals in the United States are experiencing, as Tony had said, a younger cohort of infected individuals. Uh, with the first surge of the uh, strain of uh, COVID that came out of Wuhan, the average age of people in the hospital was 60 years of age. That has now dropped to 40 years of age in the United States with the Delta variant. So it's more infectious and it's actually um, infecting those and, and, and causing disease in those who are younger. 
So how do we combat this? We combat this by being vaccinated. And as Tonya said, that the vaccines prevent severe disease from the Delta variant. People who are vaccinated may have some breakthrough infections, but overall, this the vaccines present, prevent severe disease. And in fact, only 0.01% of deaths caused by the Delta variant are in those who are vaccinated. So the vaccine does protect us from severe disease from the Delta variant. Sarah, then put that in the context of the workforce. How does that play out? Yeah, so to be honest, to protect your work, your workforce and your workplace, the, you would need a, a high percentage of persons who work there to be vaccinated. And how do you, how do you encourage that? Well, one way is to um, have forums such as this where people can be educated about the vaccines and also actually have area, um, email areas where, where um, employees can actually send their questions and then concerns about vaccination. Furthermore, um, to encourage vaccination in the workplace, it's really important to have sort of champions of vaccination. So people who are high up in the workplace who get vaccinated and actually may even show on social media, hey, I'm getting vaccinated. But really to protect your workplace and to allow the majority of your people to come back to the workplace, we will need a high vaccination rate. The only way that we will uh, get out, really prevent new infections with the Delta variant is to vaccinate and to vaccinate our way out of these this um, viral, these, this virus infections. And, and Sarah, um, Tony has echoed the same comments and theme that you, you have uh, told our listeners and, and, and guests today. I guess the question for me, and, and we'll probably have some more comment on it at a later date, is how do employers encourage that? Because that's complex. And if you read the papers worldwide, there's such a wide range of, to want a better word, incentives that have been provided to try and coerce, um, kid, uh, get into operation, uh, the vaccinations. Your thoughts there, please. Sure. I think really the best way to encourage people to vaccinate is to make it a positive um, reinforcement. In other words, let people know that if you get vaccinated, it's not really just to protect you, but it's also to protect your workmates and your family. So first of all, it's sort of a socially responsible thing to do. But secondly, if people have concerns, be open to those concerns and help to help address those concerns with facts. That's the major issue is that there's a lot of misleading facts out there in social media. So if a workplace can have access to the true facts about the vaccines and how effective these vaccines are in preventing serious disease, I think that will help encourage um, employees to become vaccinated. And also if they realize the only way that we can get back to our normal workplace is to be vaccinated to make sure and to ensure that the majority of my workmates are vaccinated. Um, that is the only way that we can get back to a, a more normal workplace. Sarah, thank you very much. Both you and Tony have given a very, very thorough overview in terms of the scientific perspective of where we're at, what things are happening and some of the things going forward. So I appreciate uh, your comments and Tony's from a science and medical perspective. So thank you. I now want to turn our attention, if I may, to mental health. And in the last couple of weeks, there has been an amazing increase and emphasis upon that in dialogue uh, at just about every, every centre of uh, conversation uh, with most people from government right through to every area. And I'd like to ask Professor Richard Bryant to make comment in relation to that. Um, uh, Richard, good morning. Good morning. I'm really delighted for you to join us today and, and to dovetail, if you like, from into the medical, but into your own discipline of, so, of uh, psychology and the mental. Uh, uh, well, really, I'd like to start by trying to understand the construct or the, the physiology, the mental aspects when we talk about this mental health. It's such a broad term. Can you give us some sense of what it really means? Well, in the context of uh, COVID, um, really we're talking about a few conditions um, and, and the most common ones in the community are anxiety and depression. Um, so there's been an incredible amount of work done uh, internationally over the last 18 months, um, both on people who've been infected and hospitalised, but also just on general communities during lockdown um, that are telling us that, yes, relative to uh, 
2019 and 2000 and uh, before that, 18. Um, in 20 and 21, we've seen marked increases in community rates of anxiety and depression. Um, and in a sense, it's not surprising to anybody on, the, on, on, on this uh, session here to, to, to hear that. Um, being in lockdown does take away a lot of people's normal sources of enjoyment. It uh, creates a lot of uh, financial stress on people, which we know from previous downturns in economies that this is a, a major cause of depression. Um, and the general anxieties about not being able to put food on the table, having pressure on me by homeschooling, um, not being able to see friends and family, and of course, the basis of um, the fear of the uh, virus itself. Will I get infected? And fear of um, not seeing my family who may be being infected, F fear of um, elderly and aged care, et cetera. So we know that around the world, um, rates of anxiety and depression are about up to one in four in the community, which is extremely high. Now, I'm not saying those people have got anxiety or depressive disorders, but they're elevated rates of anxiety and depression. I think the other uh, chatter we've heard a lot about, which is very curious, is about suicide. And at the beginning of the pandemic, there was huge concern about rates of suicide increasing during the pandemic. And one of the things we've seen globally is that, in fact, there has not been an increase in suicide in um, really any Western country. Um, Japan's a bit of an exception. Um, but by and large, we haven't seen the expected increases. Um, but that's not to say that suicidal risk isn't there. And uh, there's probably, from what we've seen in some data, some subgroups within communities, um, certain uh, disadvantaged people, the people that are under most pressure, the most financially stretched people, they are more at risk during the pandemic. Um, but they're the, the main ones that we tend to see. Um, and probably the one other what I would mention is the post-traumatic stress. Um, and this is mainly for people who have been in ICU um, and have gone through life-threatening experiences and uh, the rates, particularly from Europe, um, where there's been some good studies done, show that the rates of um, PTSD following uh, those who have survived following ICU are, are quite elevated. Uh, Professor, are there certain cohorts that tend to be biased towards aspects associated with mental stress and so on in terms of COVID? D does there seem to be, uh, for example, my question is probably very simplistic and maybe not for today, but I really worry about the young students doing their exams and, and all of that. I I take a keen interest uh, in that, and I know all of you do yourselves, but is there certain age groups where the mental stress seems to uh, gather more um, elasticity, yeah. more? Well, it's been an interesting trend, again, globally. Um, very strong evidence around the world that it has been the young age group that's been most at risk. Um, older people have actually coped psychologically with the pandemic much better than younger people. It's that young age group, probably you know, up to the age of about 30, they're the ones most at risk of actually increases in anxiety and depression. Um, people speculate a lot as to why, and clearly it's affected things like uh, school study, university study, mm. it's affected a lot of employment opportunity. Um, these people rely a lot on social interaction and it's at a stage of their lives where they're making critical steps in their careers and relationships, et cetera. And a lot of this has just been put on hold for two years. And that's a, that's a massive hit. And so they're the people who are most at risk. Thank you very, very much for that, that reflection. Uh, Richard, I, I, I want to ask you, like I asked Tony and Sarah, a, a question that requires uh, some divinity. A, a governments, and I, I, I'm really talking about Australian governments and so on, without being politically, I, it's, that's not of interest to us today in my mind, but, but governments, are, are they doing enough and businesses? And if they're not, what could we be doing more in this whole space? Because the numbers are growing. It's an interesting question and obviously it's been debated a lot. And I would say in, in defence of our governments, um, particularly the federal, um, we at the moment actually have a federal government that's more attuned to mental health than uh -huh. we've had in decades. 
um, they, they have put mental health really at the top of you know their agenda for a long time, and through the pandemic, they're, they're still doing it. So they've put a lot of resources to it. They've made a lot of services available. Um, I would say that uh, what we're probably missing a bit is, is a greater evidence base about really what is the best way we should be uh, helping people uh, through the pandemic and after the, the acute period of the pandemic, when we get into what the government's calling consolidation phase, you know, what do we do in the longer term about mental health? And because it's, it's happened so quickly and the, the evidence base for how we come up with the best mental health programs to do that has lagged behind. I mean, it's been phenomenal how quickly the vaccines have been developed, tested and implemented. It's been mind boggling, but we haven't seen comparable um, development and implementation of mental health programs. And there's been a, a huge influx in mental health services. Like in the last month alone, Lifelines had more calls to it than mm. it has in its 58 year history. Mm. Um, it's been inundated. But where is the evidence to shape what governments, what we should be telling governments about what to do? And trials are underway around the world. We've been doing them at UNSW and at the Westmead Institute. And we've got you know, good evidence in our, our trials that video conferencing delivered programs can effectively reduce anxiety and depression. But we need more evidence like that. So, Richard, I, I, if I'm interpreting your, your reflections, just throwing money at it is not a panacea, is not uh, uh, going to give um, uh, thoughtful uh, outcomes. In some ways, it needs to be more robustness. Well, it's like everything else. We need to be driven by the science, by the evidence. Mm. And um, it's great that people are willing to put money towards it and to prioritise it, but it needs to be done smartly. And it's, it's been the catch cry throughout the pandemic. And Australia has been reasonably good, um, give or take, about sort of listening to scientists and, and health experts about you know, the direction it takes. Um, but it needs to in the mental health domain as well but it needs data to do that. And that's where the field needs to be sort of doing the work quickly and agilely, you know, to be able to provide government with that data. Richard, thank you very much for your insights into the whole mental health state. It really complements what both Tony and Sarah have been able to do and tell us this morning or this afternoon. So thank you very much. I now really want to move towards the business end because that is causing a lot of consternation and a lot of concern, and I'm sure that that's related particularly what, uh, Richard, you were talking about. And I, I'm, I'm really delighted to ask uh, Dr Brendan Ryan to tell us a whole range of things. Thanks for joining us, uh, 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 Brendan. It's really lovely to have you. Uh, as uh, uh, most people knew from uh, the conversation before, we're now moving towards a more quantitative um, aspects uh, as you being the chief economist for KPMG. Um, so I'll be very interested in your thoughts coming from a similar background. Um, Brendan, in what ways has COVID altered the Australian workplace and to what extent are these changes permanent, if at all? Uh, look, very interesting question, Jim. I think that one of the things that we have seen um, really from a sort of needs must perspective uh, is a turbocharging of how technology has helped um, different businesses deliver their services uh, online and for, for workers to work remotely, but still in a connected way. I think that, you know, um, one of the most prominent examples in, in keeping on a health theme is the fact that you're now seeing telehealth delivered to such a substantial proportion of the Australian population, I think it accounted for nearly uh, one fifth of all um, uh, Medicare appointments uh, during the first lockdown period. Now, th that was something that had been considered, and and um, you know various governments had been thinking through how best to implement, um, and then that change was pretty much forced upon us. Now, that's never going to go back. I think that telehealth both through GP appointments and also mental health appointments uh, and other specialists is now something that we're going to see as part of the permanent suite of um, uh, health services that are provided in Australia. Now, I think the same can be said in a whole range of other service type industries 
uh, like my own, the professional services, where, you know, I myself, um, since about March of last year, have only made it into the KPMG office on probably half a dozen occasions. Uh, I run a practice nationally of about 25 people uh, and we've just been doing completely everything online, um, team meetings, group meetings, seminars, presentations, client delivery work. And, and so I think that there's going to um, come from it uh, a sustainability of flexibility, I think, uh, in working arrangements going forward. Clearly, there are some sectors where this can't be done um, and it's too difficult to do. So, you know, construction workers, for example, can't do working from home um, unless, of course, they're just, you know, building an extension at their own place. Um, but, you know, more so we're going to see a whole range of um, business activities that are going to enable workers more flexibility in how they deliver that work uh, and also a significant increase in the use of technology in, in also that delivery as well. There's a, a, a famous economist, Robert Solo, once said about 30 years ago that, uh, you know, he'd seen the uh, computer age everywhere except in the ad, except in productivity statistics. Well, I think that that's about to change and we're about to see a significant increase in labour productivity being driven through technologies. It's a very interesting perspective, Brendan. So you, you deal with a number of businesses from every, every every level. Looking at the tomorrows, because this is lessons learnt, and yes. all of us uh, on this uh, program today have learnt lessons um, academically, uh, socially, and so on. What are the lessons that you have learnt to take to the marketplace KPM is taking to to the place because it's mixed with psychology, it's mixed with a whole range of mental um, health potential issues and so yes. on. What are you taking to the market? Because people are looking to you for solutions very much. Well, very much many of the things that we've actually just spoken about in terms of um, uh, understanding that your workforce needs much greater flexibility now. Um, not necessarily because we're going to be in this permanent state of pandemic, much so because the workforce has now realised that it can continue to deliver high levels of quality output in much more flexible working arrangements. I think the other thing that we've also seen is that I do think that there's going to be a permanent disruption to the way business travel um, is now conducted going forward. The days of needing to shoot up to from Sydney to Melbourne for a day meeting, um, I think are well and truly over. So I think that you'll see transport sector um, having to readjust how it delivers its services going forward. Brendan, um, can I just, sorry, just stop you for a moment. I just saw Sarah shake her head in a positive way. What are you telling our audience? Uh, me or Sarah? No, Sarah. Just Sorry. for a moment, I want to come back to you, but I, I, I always try to look at body language and what people are saying and not saying, and Sarah uh, was uh, in, a, in, a, in an affirmative way uh, agreeing with what you were saying, and I, it was, it was, I, I could see that from the corner of my eye. Sarah, just a very quick response to that. I would support what Brendan is saying and that those days of um, flying here and there for work are probably... Uh, behind us and that um, Zoom and other technologies have allowed us to interact internationally um, easier than getting on a plane and flying there. So yeah. that's what I was agreeing with because, for example, in the field of science, and Tony and I both have a lot of international uh, collaborations, we are doing it all via Zoom and showing data via Zoom. So maybe we won't have to be getting on these planes and flying as much. Yes. I, I think there is one caveat to that, though, because I think face-to-face um, -face interactions develop the personal relationships. Mm. So I don't think that that will necessarily um, fall away. But once you've developed those personal relationships, I think the need to continue the face-to-face -face meetings um, uh, for that relationship to be maintained is probably less than we think. And so, you know, um, attending a conference or presenting at a conference or lecturing, for example, still made to be done initially, but then I think that what you'll find is that people's return to those activities may, may be supplemented by more technology use 
and virtual use the necessary physical presence. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Tony, please, I, I'm really pleased for this because it's it's really um, very changing society in so many ways. Tony? I agree with Brendan but uh, and with what Sarah has said, but one of the most important things that we often do is have these sidebar conversations, yes. conferences, and we also introduce our young people to those and they develop their networks. That's how I started. Yes. And it's really important. So what you say is correct. You, you, the people you know, you can pick up a phone or email them, as Sarah and I do, but uh, it's these sidebar conversations that you miss uh, and, uh, and the mentoring. And that's exactly right, Tony, why, which is why I suggested that it's not going to be fully replaced by, you know, virtual technologies. You still need to develop those relationships in the first instance and personal interaction and face-to-face -face interaction can't be replaced for those things. The other thing that I think is also going to play a role in society as a consequence of these changing um, physical dynamics of how we work is that um, houses are going to change. And we've had this, um, you know, recent focus of downsizing, of moving closer to the city, of living on top of each other in Australia where we've traditionally had the quarter acre block with the backyard. I suspect that we're going to see a bit more flexibility around that as people realise that um, if they're working from home, and their, in, and their interaction at home is going to be much more than it was before. Everyone needs a little bit of space. I've got six, I've got four, no, not six kids, four kids. Um, and, and last year was pretty tough with my oldest just doing first year university. So we actually reached the, the position that it was best for her to go to college. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to pay for her to go to college and, and for her to have that university experience. But I've still got two teenage children who are um, uh, doing schooling from home at the moment uh, and finding enough space in the house for everyone to not fall over each other and um, have negative, intense personal relationships from time to time, and, and that's a euphemism for screaming at each other. Uh, you know, we actually need the house to be, uh, you know, just that little bit bigger so that we can um, you know, have a bit of waxing and waning in those personal relationships. So I think that's going to also change architecture, how we live, um, the, the different pressures that we have on infrastructure in, um, in society. So maybe less pressure on roads, but more on pipes, pipes to provide technology, pipes to provide water and sewerage as people are living at homes more uh, than they've had in the past. So maybe the, the things that we see in terms of the infrastructure may have less pressure. It'll be the things we don't see that start to have more pressure. Uh, Brenda, just for a moment, thank you very much. I, Richard, uh, I was watching your, your, um, uh, your physical features there. Do you have a comment, um, if I've interpreted that, just looking across uh, that without putting you on the spot? Oh, I just had to laugh at at, at Brendan's comments of the, the screaming in the house. I mean, <laughs> this is just being mimicked all over the Western, no, no, all over the world um, of, of people sort of being crowded into spaces that they're not intended to live in 24 hours a day. Um, but I just want to reiterate this point about it's a, it's a very basic issue of social interaction. And, you know, there's, there's just so much work done at a, in terms of psychology, sociology, in terms of the brain functions, everything. We do need to physically interact. And if we don't do that, then it actually has huge negative impacts at, on many, many levels. And that's why we do need, to, we can't persist living this way forever. Um, a lot of people will suffer. Richard, thank, thank you very much for that. Just as a comment, if I can just say, I've noticed the increasing traffic through LinkedIn and Facebook and a whole range of other things, trying to make those connections, which has been a theme running through uh, our recent conversation. Uh, Brendan, let me ask you this question, if I can, and, and I'd like you to reflect upon, uh, upon this. Do you think that the government could consider putting together, and I mean this sincerely, a minister for adaptation? 
that we need, and that may not be the right term, but we need a minister to really focus on what's being said by you uh, uh, this afternoon. Is there a need to really put a focus on that? Uh, uh, look, Jim, and, and with all due respect as well to um, any public sector colleagues that might be on the phone here uh, or the teleconference here, um, government is not the panacea for innovation. Um, really, pan the panacea is for innovation is, you know, coming through, um, you know, the private sector, um, you know, kids in garages, mm -hmm. our very, our lucky um, the, the fact that we're lucky to have such eminent professors uh, doing this medical research mm -hmm. and really what the role of government, in my opinion, should be doing is to minimise red tape, to um, cut noise out of the system that takes away from our innovators from being able to innovate, to provide base level of support that um, provides financial safety nets for them if they're living on shoestring budgets. Um, but but also to provide risk frameworks so that, you know, in, in any forms of innovation, they don't necessarily put the public at risk while they're doing that as well. So, you know, I'm, I don't necessarily think that if we gave someone a title of a minister for adaptation and innovation, that they would be able to achieve anything more than, in, in fact, I'd rather have a, a, um, a minister for, for um, efficient government um, that allows for, um, you know, the rest of us to actually get on with things uh, uh, and, and, and achieve what we're trying to achieve. Now, I, I don't mean that in an unkind way. It's just, you know, we think about what the role of government's there for and, and I think that it's, in fact, the private sector and the, and the public and the individuals to create innovation um, and it's there for the government to help that innovation um, 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 diffuse its way through society with as least hurdles as possible. Brendan, that's great insight. Just my final question to you, and it's an important question. At the moment, uh, there is, and this is one economist speaking to another economist, uh, the impact of uh, COVID in terms of cash flow on small business, 92% of businesses employ less than 5 per pe yep. people. It, is it as bad as what they say? Um, look, I think it is. Uh, and, you know, one of the big challenges that we have had in um, certainly this second wave of COVID is making sure that the cash flow um, is hitting businesses that need it the most and that, that cash support, um, you know, and the way that we've transitioned from um, broad-based Commonwealth government support um, to now much more targeted support that's provided by both the Commonwealth and states. I certainly accept that that is um, what needs to happen. I think that um, as we work our way through the pandemic in terms of getting people vaccinated um, and the risk that um, we're facing as a community um, starts to diminish, um, um, although I think that our... Um, uh, epidemiologists on on this, and I think I've sort of reached this conclusion last week, is that everyone's going to get COVID in some way, either through a vaccination or getting it, that this is, you can see in Israel that 92% of the population have either had COVID, had one vaccination or two vaccinations, and they're getting daily case numbers that are about 50% of their previous peaks. So this is very much moving into the pandemic of the unvaccinated or the uncovered. Um, and so, um, you know, that that support from the government needs to be um, um, targeted and timely. Um, and, and as that risk to the population declines, the targeted support from the government should also match that profile as well. I am a firm thank believer you. of that. Brendan, thank you so much uh, for your overview. I was just watching Tony and Sarah as soon as you talked about epidemiologists and so on. I just want to shoot to Tony for one minute and then I'm going to go to Mario. But just a very quick response there, Tony, just to, to the Israel situation and, and Brendan's comments, because I, 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 I favour the brave. Well, uh, I think um, 
it's certainly true around the world that this is an epidemic of uh, the unvaccinated, that 95% of uh, cases in Britain, for instance, of Delta were occurring in the unvaccinated. doesn't go to sh say that you can't get some of these breakthrough asymptomatic infections and in people are immunised. This is a feature of Delta that we've seen. And I mentioned before that uh, you have this hierarchy of protectiveness uh, in, uh, in COVID, which is protection against death, against severe disease, and then uh, less protection against mild disease and a little less against um, uh, against asymptomatic infection. That's why the recommendation in the USA that Sarah knows so well is to continue using masks and all of us are using masks and other social distancing approaches until we actually get a high enough level of immunisation in the community to drive down the circulation of uh, uh, of this Delta variant. It's also incredibly important that we immunise the world to stop new variants from uh, emerging. And uh, Indonesia is one of our big issues, Sarah, isn't it? Absolutely, Tony. Um, I think there's still 6.4 billion people in the world who have not had uh, vaccination or have access to vaccination. Now, until we are able to vaccinate the world, we won't uh, see the last of this this virus. So really, we have to vaccinate our way out of the out of this pandemic. Also, um, we're really in a race between vaccination and and variants. And the more people are vaccinated, the fewer variants we will see that will emerge. And we may see variants that emerge that are even more infectious than the Delta variant. So we really do need to see worldwide vaccination. Real quick. Yes, fast. Really delighted to have such eminent people talk about COVID from a perspective of their own disciplines. Dr. Brendan uh, Ryan, Chief Economist of KPMG, Professor Richard Ryan, Professor of Psychology, University of New South Wales, Professor Tony Cunningham, and also Professor Sarah Palmer, uh, great researchers, world-renowned from Westmead Medical Research Institute. And I hope I, I said this, Tony, I want to give respect where it's due. You were the founder of uh, Westmead Medical Research Institute, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. If I've said it before, um, I'm delighted to say it again. Uh, I'm really delighted now to ask Mario Bex, an expert in the whole area of cybersecurity, information management. And information is such a critical tool that helps us propel towards or away from something. Uh, Mario, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, Dr. Jim, and I'd like to say thank you, everybody today who is present from all the experts, Dr. Tony, uh, Professor Sarah, Richard, anybody else who already mentioned the name. Um, just in a nutshell, um, my experience is um, uh, I was born in, in communism. I was educated since the 14 military school. And then, you know, my, my occupational hazard was driving me from, from one side to another side. So I was working in uh, military intelligence, diplomatic intelligence, which is basically um, working a lot of it, uh, disinformation, misinformation. So before I continue, I'd like to give you some small historical data quickly to just understand the difference between disinformation, misinformation. Uh, the, the first written document about misinformation and disinformation, it's actually Potemkin villages, which has been um, one of the most famous ex examples, actually. Um, Grigory Potemkin orchestrated the building of fake villages to impress his former lover, Empress Catherine the Great, when she visited uh, newly conquered territories. Uh, it's a beautiful story, but a fake one. Um, the idea of Potemkin villages is designed to disinform the Ottoman Empire and to believe that Russia was weak um, and that they just built wooden facades. The truth is, uh, that story has been one first written document. However, in the late uh, 30s and 40s, uh, Soviet Union, uh, which I was, you know, being educated to that uh, to that system later on in communism Yugoslavia, the the, the 1950 through 1952, the Stalin accepted a new plan called disinformacja, which was basically being built how we can uh, go against the Western society uh, and, uh, and the OCD countries today 
without spending so much money into the weapons and the race and everything else. So they adopted that disinformation as a part of the global um, approach, which is basically being spent about 20% on uh, espionage and, and, and uh, seeking information and basically collecting information and then converting uh, society um, to the couple elements I was going to mention later. So this information, misinformation, particularly online, it's all around us. It has shown how vulnerable we are as a society, particularly uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, fact, check, fact, fact checking, it's actually becoming uh, grotesque and, and, and misleading for one simple reason. Information has the value, it's a tangible. And uh, information is being, can be found everywhere today on social media. Uh, you can listen to the radio. There's a, a variety of the experts. However, um, uh, misinformation uh, is a sharing of published information that's more or less accurate and everybody can distribute misinformation. So it's not harmful as it is. Where the problem is, is this information difference between misinformation, disinformation, it is the one letter, but this information has an intent behind uh, It's usually based on a true event, um, so we'll include the facts around which false story will be built. Um, you must understand what this information is deliberately distorted information that is secretly leaked into this community. Now, Australia as a, as a country, we are uh, geographically we are separated from the rest of the world, main lanes and everything else. And everything was happening beyond horizon, uh, we can influence and everything beyond horizon other countries can influence us by monitoring our media and so on. <clears throat> so when I say it's a deliberately created uh, intent to deceive, uh, this information doesn't necessarily need to come from the mainstream media or the media at all or the populace of Australia. It comes from overseas and sometimes for example, I'll give you the example, hybrid warfare, which was a three-pronged warfare China adopted in 1999. They adopted all learnings from the Soviet Union, and they developed a 50 cents party, which just basically sits behind the screens, and they uh, sifting the information from around the globe, and they're analyzing, coming in contact with somebody who has a real information, and they store that information, put in the public bank. And that's where the bite is actually happening. Uh, less known to the world this information, it's, it's most used as a subversive tactics, which is counter media influence. So this information, it's been as a consistent of five elements. One is a, a infiltration manipulation, which is going to the person or to the group of people, which is more as a part of the moralization. So you're educating, educating society for some period of time and you try to create new, uh, new, new learnings so people adopt this information. Second one is destabilization, which basically, you know, utilizing that uh, people to spread information for, for somebody. Then you have artificial made crisis, uh, which we can see it uh, across the globe. Due to this information, people have that bite. And you must understand that every source of information is a human. It's not a machine, it's not an alien, it's nobody else. And usually this information comes as a part of the sum of the sales plan. While misinformation, everybody can elaborate. I can take it to the words of the uh, Professor Tony or uh, Professor Sarah and say like, blah, 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 why does this, this, and this, and this. Uh, I do remember the time in Chernobyl, I was, I was in military school, and you know the government was doing the process similar like today, we can see overseas information towards us. It comes that didn't come, but we sent out. It's beautiful and cool, and we are great and everything else. But it wasn't that as well. Now, the danger of misinformation in and disinformation, misinformation. It's not in social media. You will maybe remember 2010 when uh, in Tunisia was a uh, uh, produce vendor set himself on a fire. And then the entire Mediterranean, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, everybody else, shut down internet because the Twitter becomes the main platform for spreading information about what's happening in Tunisia. But what happened then, and research has been shown, and you know, I remember in, in, in system I used to work in communism, the most dangerous part of information has been spread word by mouth. So people are going to use, and in Australia we can see this, you know, when people are 
sit at home watching TV and, uh, you know, uh, they become bored, they start talking to the neighbors or the people. Those informations are the most critical information when it comes to misinformation and disinformation. On the same token, once when you control the media and you try to put proper information there, the populace or citizens already had their opinion. And you know, surely that's a, in a nutshell is a problem because as I am, I'm, I'm not born Australian, as you can hear it, English is not my first language. Um, we, we talk to people overseas. So just look at the number of the people in Australia who don't speak English, who they're going to seek information from. They're going to go overseas with the, with the friends, with the family, and everything else. How's things in Indonesia? Uh, the, uh, Professor Sarah Palmer told me everybody in, in Indonesia got uh, COVID to them. Their neighbor says, ah, oh, it's not true. They don't know. They have no idea. And that's how misinformation starts, actually. The point with misinformation, disinformation, it's very simple. This is, I try to teach this and lecture for years. It is not who says what, but what has been said. The body information is not who said. Anybody can say something. I heard, heard say, you know, Dr. Jim Tagger told me, you know, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a new... Would I be truthful what I told you, Mario? Yeah, that's true, really that's true. But the value, yeah, the value, the capturing, the capturing of information, the value, because it's tangible, it's what has been said, because it's intent behind. And reading that one, and when you say intent, there's emotions, weapons, uh, words become uh, weapons because they're weaponized. They're putting emotions inside. Now, ordinary people, they can express their anger, they can express their disappointment, and you can read that one. But what I'm seeing in social media, information coming beyond the horizon, placing into the public, to the open sources, and they are weaponized because they put the emotions inside. And that's where the danger is. Um, before my, we have... Uh, excuse yes, me for a moment. You've hit on a very good point, in my humble opinion, in terms of... Let, 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 let's drill down a bit further. It's yes. uh, nearly five past one and we've only got about 25 minutes to go. And, but I want to ask you this question. You're talking about disinformation and misinformation. Let's just take the situations that have arisen in terms of Sydney, Melbourne and other capitals. And, you know, with particular, and Melissa may talk about this later, but, you know, the problems about misinformation, that's really what you're saying as being, that can turn into being a weapon and that can be used to influence people's behaviour. I think, is that what, where you, what you're alluding to? Absolutely. Like, so, you know, honestly, I just want to say that this, I never met uh, Professor uh, Tony or Professor Sarah, if I'm mistitling uh, uh, people. This is the best explanation of the virus I've ever heard. So when the people tune in TV, and they're seeing there are so many experts there on TV who are not experts, like uh, uh, Mr. Tony or Sarah, this is where the confusion rise. And that's exploration of people's mind, because uh, readability of people watching TV and news, it's quite lower and they they don't understand it. So weapons, weaponized words, put emotions, it's almost dangerous. And what we put out, somebody else oversees, analyzes, and comes back as a deliberately placed information to come out and we buy for this. So it's not important who said what, but what has been said, because only that way it's a critical thinking. I can't talk about vaccines, Dr. Jim. And then uh, uh, Sarah says to me, Mario, what's your qualifications in vaccines? I said, like, well, nothing. It's, that's the that's the public needs to be uh, acknowledged and be treated well. So th thank you for that. Mario, what are the strategies then that can be implemented to try and break this down? Because that's really critical. The, the upshot and the frequency of what's happened over the last month and a half, two months, uh, by the general public has never been seen before. I would say education. When I was working, when I was working in a communist system, uh, usually we will find a self-egocentric, uh, selfish people who will be, uh, they wanted to be seen, they will be known and they will be used and uh, later on um, uh, disposed, you know, they'll not be important to the cause. Now, we need to build a platform like this one where the professionals like yourself, Sarah, and uh, Dr. Richard Bryan talking about, about uh, I was serious, I was believing that there's so many suicides. This is the first time that somebody professional like uh, Richard says, this is what the statistics are. So it needs to be the body. And as I'm pretty sure Sarah, she said this, and I mean, we need to find the people to carry that message and say, 
that's how supported statistics, statistics, statistic, statistically it is. This is what the message it is. This is why vaccine is important. Instead of people, you know, I mean, and that group of people spreading this information or this information overseas countries or governments will find no fertile soil to proceed anymore. So we need to have the uniquely one body which is gonna utilize experts who's gonna be there and talk about vaccines, about COVID, about mental health, not having so many experts because as I say, again, when I'm talking daily with, the, with, the, with the, my investigators and my staff, they, uh, um, their heads are gonna explode to the gym because they know who to believe. So I say, it's not important who said what, what has been said, and what has been said has a merit by experts like this panel. Maria, thanks for joining us today. Well, your topic in relation to information management is so critical. We, we do things based on information, the quality of information, whether it's in research, whether it's in business, whether it's in um, a psychology paper, an A paper, is all about information Absolutely. and it's all about how we respond to that in our daily and professional lives. I can't thank, thank you enough with regards to you. how you presented that today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really delighted to for our final speaker, and I'm sorry, Melissa, that uh, the order has gone this way. There was a reason for looking at that from a scientific point of view to uh, a business and sociology and sociological uh, perspective, I'm, I'm really delighted that you could join us today. And we're going to look at the migrant community and look at the impact that that's happening. And, you know, our hearts go out to a whole range of people worldwide, the Afghanistan situation, uh, people, it, it really, uh, from my perspective, um, is, is very sad what uh, has taken place. But let's, let's move along. Uh, Melissa, what, what are some of the challenges that you're facing with regards to, we have a, 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 an acronym called COLD, Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Adolescents. What are some of the challenges that they're facing in multicultural uh, communities and how is the pandemic affecting them? Hi, Jim, and hello to everyone. Thank you, firstly, for inviting me on behalf of my organisation, which is the Community Migrant Resource Centre. We're a medium-sized organisation in Western Sydney with a huge footprint rather in Western Sydney and going right up to the Northern Sydney regions, including um, the Top Ride and West Ride areas. Um, Jim, there are a number of barriers and challenges that our communities have faced in the first lockdown as well as now. And I'd say it's even more bigger in this current one. I'd like to start, I think the most important one is the loss of income. Uh, we've seen that across the board with many of our migrant communities and um, our diverse communities. So I'm going to talk on behalf of our diverse communities, which is our culturally and linguistically diverse communities, Jim. Yes. Uh, more from the refugee communities that we're dealing with, uh, people who are on a lower income, people who are newly arrived, who've been in the country for one to five years. Uh, they've been hit with regard to loss of income. Um, I'd say many, especially in the hospitality or the retail or, you know, people who've been in jobs in factories, packaging, um, where they've had loss of hours, loss of shifts. Some have loss of jobs totally. So I'm going to outline a number of um, the challenges, not just around income, but um, issues related to debt and because there's no income. And so people are, you know, increasing their levels of debt. Um, job loss for different visa cohorts. Now there are a lot of people that are on temporary protection and temporary, temporary visas. And so these people have been impacted, I'd say, in a very, very huge and big way. We've also seen a loss of job loss in a particular industry, and that has impacted and hit us in a very big way. But more exploitation and unsafe work conditions for our migrant populations, I'd say our refugee communities, where they've been threatened to be sent back, or that they, if, you know, a loss of job if they speak up. 
And so I think that has really hit in a very uh, subtle way as well. But exploitation has been very evident. And especially if they speak up, which is really very sad. Um, something like the incidence of domestic violence has impacted everybody, as we know, the general population. But domestic violence and a spike in family violence is what we have observed in many of our cult, in our, in our, the women, or, you know, the communities that we're dealing with. So there is a huge spike, as we've seen nationally and statistics, and you've just alluded to, you know, uh, people like Lifeline and um, people seeking help. I think it's never been as high as it is at this point in time. Mental health, mental health has skyrocketed I think right now for all our communities not just the ones especially the ones in the last week with the Taliban and you know the Afghan situation uh, I've had you know staff reporting the huge impact that it is having here upon because of the relatives and the relations and the people overseas but just for people who are actually reliving that trauma of the past and just the fact that this is all coming back again. So mental health is one of the very biggest ones. Um, I think for the recent arrivals, it was just when they thought that they were settled and settling in well, and this has kind of taken them, COVID has come and impacted them in yet another way. Abuse and violence at home, family relationships suffering, so many of these practical barriers and also the inability, Jim, like I spoke to you the last week on the phone, we spoke, the inability to express themselves because of their language barriers, because of their communication. Um, the financial hardships for families, large families, you know, the ones that have multiple children and if the father as a breadwinner is having, a, you know, having lost his job, how is it possible to be able to meet those needs? And um, for example, like I said to you in the schools, um, you know, people with large families having a smaller house, um, not having multiple rooms, where do you go to have a safe place to do your, right now, for example, my daughter is doing her, her um, HSC trials. She is well, she is in a safe place. Fortunately, we have multiple rooms, but or, you know, it would have been hard for me to do this call if I had not had multiple rooms. But what about the families that have been impacted with small, um, you know, not many, many kids and um, using devices? That's the one I spoke to you last week about, Jim, which yes. has been reported constantly by our staff and, you know, the communities that we're working with. People don't have multiple de devices and we're sharing the one device, for example that has impacted in a very, very big way across the board, not just one of our communities, but I'd say all data. No one is factoring the expense of data, you know? Uh, that is expensive as well. So it's not just having a device, but we've had, I've had examples of a staff saying, you know, the father, for example, and that's a conversation you and I had as well, Jim, sharing his mobile phone, the one device, or the one laptop being shared by four children. How do you have separate hours, separate, separate times, Zoom hours, not everybody, not all schools are providing laptops as well. So the young ones, the children in the family, this is another huge one. And the inability of the family to actually meet these basic needs. Today, internet, laptops, devices are become the most basic needs. Financial hardships are, you know, prompting these. Um, poor connections, Wi-Fi devices, I won't go there again. Uh, high cost of rent, uh, rent, you know, the rent is all of the money or over 40% of the money that, you know, people are earning is put in um, rent. Uh, no relief over there. And so it's very hard to even have or think about going and getting another device or a laptop. Increasing homelessness increasing the issue and the pressure of, you know, uh, people being able to keep their housing only because of the financial hardships. Long lasting distress, anger, sense of dehumanization. I think what COVID has done to many of our communities at the bottom is a sense of de de dehumanization. 
I'll give you an example when the students or the international students and you know a lot of our temporary workers as well are feeling like that when the announcement was made you know make your way home find your way home find your way back home that took a huge hit on you know these had a huge impact and made a big hit on our communities especially these communities because they just felt am i not important anymore you know so of course um, this conversation is not only about the international students but i think many of the client of our groups that we're working with are temporary people on temporary uh, visas so i want to just allude you to a um, make reference to a research by the UTS the UNSW and the migrant workers justice initiative that actually did a research on 6000 a sample of 6000 uh, Laurie Berg is one of the key uh, researchers there i'm not sure if everybody's heard about this one but it was anonymous and people um, were actually sharing and talking about the impact of this um, pandemic at the start of the pandemic about you know this is at the end of the first one where people were talking about the hardships the ones that had to go home they couldn't go home because of no finances they couldn't go home because the borders were closed they couldn't go home because there were no airports operating or no domestic flights operating no connecting flights to where they came as a result they've continued they're in this country and they're very hidden no one's talking about them only because they are on that temporary visa uh, kind of um, 51, 57, Jim, 57% of them did not want to go home. Most of these people have made a huge investment in Australia, taking loans to even come here in the first place. Um, these are the people that we're dealing with. These are the people that are calling us. This morning, we had a call, a huge call, a, a huge request for, um, um, again, you know, we get these requests all the time, sorry, but because of privacy, I won't go into details, but the same thing is please help me. And for domestic violence purposes, for all these reasons, Jim, can I just say the first lockdown was easier and better, but as an organization, we are, we've got so many of our staff who are out there in Western Sydney dealing with our communities on a day-to-day -day basis, every day and who are facing all of these challenges. And this is the information that is being fed through to the organization. So to sum up, I'd say the impact and the specific challenges have been financial, physical, psychological for all these reasons. Melissa, can I put that into context for everyone? I've been working very closely with Melissa and I have the most up respect for you and your organization, some 160 staff. Uh, dealing with uh, refugees and migrants. We've got a massive problem where we've got young people attempting their trials and their HSC, uh, where there's three to six, seven people living in a two bedroom place, no laptop, no iPad. And what's the exams going to be on? iPads and laptops. Um, uh, sorry, my heart breaks from for because of that uh, and the uh, um, the work. Can I just say congratulate you and your people, uh, your team, if you like, Melissa, with regards to that. I want to go back and focus. Um, uh, how are young migrant refugees responding to vaccinations? Because I think Tony and Sarah in particular would be very interested. And I want to go to, uh, I've got some questions. It's nearly 20 past uh, one, and we've got about seven, eight minutes uh, to go. And there's some questions that have come through and I really want to uh, ask for people's responses. So just a response. How are they in your world uh, responding to vaccination? Jim, thank you. Many of our staff, uh, I know many of our managers, I can see on the Zoom as well, and some of our staff and people from my board, uh, because I did pass this uh, information around. So I'm happy that they could join us. Uh, you. Our young people are getting on board uh, slowly but surely. The take up has been slower with many, as we know in the stats as well, um, there has been um, concerns and there have been concerns for various reasons, cultural, cultural reasons, people were fearful, not enough of information that has been provided. The information now that has come up, I think there is a bigger take up, a sure, uh, slowly but surely. There, there is a take up now. 
All right. On on behalf of everybody, on behalf of the Institute and uh, Access, thank you again personally and professionally for the work that you do, uh, as I echo that to all our guests here today. It's been incredibly enriching, saddened, but enriching from the point of view of hearing the stories, but also enriching from the great work as we go forward in our society to try and overcome the, 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 the issues that, that are challenging us as a society. Uh, there are a number of questions I've got here, and if my eyes have been wandering, it's because to try and consolidate them in a way that allows people to uh, um, respond. And Richard, uh, three questions have come to you because of the mental health um, issue. Um, I, I think you're still there, uh, um, Richard. Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I can't see you there. If I could just uh, summarise the, the questions, they're essentially saying what, if anything, can schools do, particularly for migrants um, and refugees, to understand what Mario was talking about, the information, disinformation and misinformation type of theme coming through. How can we help them understand to translate that back to the home front if, if, if it's an issue? It is an issue. Um, I mean, I'll just share that I'm part of a group at UNSW that's just done a study. It's a longitudinal study. So we've been assessing refugees in Australia uh, for a period of time well before the pandemic. So we followed them up during the pandemic. And one of the things we asked them was about their attitudes to vaccines. Mm -hmm. And there was significant hesitancy about vaccines. And the reasons for those are actually many of them are shared with mainstream Australia. But one of them, you know, a major one is about concerns of uh, trusting government. And in the background of refugees, it's not surprising that they're reluctant to trust government messages, um, given where, you know, their experiences back home. I think one of the take homes from that is that in terms of uh, refugee groups, and I think migrant groups generally, it's having local champions within their own uh, communities that can actually promote it. Um, they are going to have far more traction than government messaging. And this is actually already happening in many parts and happening very successfully. Um, and I think when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, um, it has to be a multi-pronged approach. Um, we know that uh, just generally, not just refugees, but across the board, a lot of people in the community do not think logically. They think and make decisions emotionally. Been an enormous amount of work done on this in the area of economics and psychology and sociology, et cetera. So I think it's good to give people facts, but I think we also need to uh, just come at this more from an emotional, to be honest, a marketing advertising perspective. And we need to sway people using nudging and doing whatever else we can to motivate people and shift their thinking so we can get the jabs in the arms. Um, it's not going to be one size fits all because not everybody thinks logically. Richard, thank you for those very deep and, and meaningful uh, reflections in relation to the situations at, 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 at Wood. Can I ask each and every one of you, I'm going to give you about 30 or 40 seconds of anything that you feel is, is, is important. It's 1.24. And uh, I'd be remiss of me not to ask any of you. You may not want to say anything. It's not a question, but I do want to finish professionally at 1.30. But is there anything um, going through? So uh, I'll leave it to you, please. Um, from, from, from an economics perspective, I think it's going to be really quite interesting um, how the politics of opening up is going to play out um, in the next little while. Clearly, we're seeing two camps um, of uh, the Commonwealth Government and the New South Wales Government um, saying that soft openings are going to be required. Otherwise, the economy, from a supply side perspective, is just going to be um, mm -hmm. shut down for too long. Um, but, but then you're getting Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia talking about still needing to um, keep restrictions in place even when you're getting 70 or 80 percent of the population double dosed. Um, I think that how this plays out is going to be um, incredibly important um, for all the factors we've spoken about today, um, not least 
um, the health and mental well-being of uh, the populations. Thank you, Brendan. Can I say something, Dr. Jimmy? If I can interrupt, you know, I would like to say thank you to everybody who was today presenting, and I'd like to say thank you to everybody who attended today. Um, you know, I am the ex-military man, and we always had that expression, uh, learning from the uh, Zeno from 430 before Christ, Christ, you know, united all the Greeks and they come back to Greek. As long as people have their key objective, and as long as they know what they're going to achieve by vaccinations, and that's what it is. The key message it is, what we're going to achieve. What's the key objective of vaccination? I know it's protection. Look, I got a 40, 40 plus vaccine, vaccines in 20 years plus in military. Have no problem with that one. But what it is, people are, particularly our generation, what is the key objective? Not just the protecting. They want to talk to people like yourself. So I'm inviting the, Dr. Jim and uh, Michael Walls have the, this exactly panel and invite more people on this conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Mario. Jim, can I just quickly say that we at the MRC have been on the front foot and I think that's the, the way to go forward. Uh, we have been providing translated information and material to all of our clients in their languages. Uh, we've been a pillar of strength and support to hundreds and hundreds of our uh, communities. And I think going forward, education and awareness of the risk and motivation and having those local champions uh, are very important, dissemination of information, and also at the same time, uh, bring to the notice of the government all these issues so that they can also work, work closely with not-for-profits and, and other NGOs like us who are out there in Western Sydney. Thank you, Melissa, to you and your team, for the great work you do, particularly in Western Sydney. Thank you. Uh, any others, Tony? I, I don't think I've ever seen, I mean, I've been working in vaccines for nearly uh, uh, 25 years, in fact, since 1992. And I, I, we've edited books and we've talked about vaccine hesitancy or vaccine uptake. And I've never seen such an emphasis on the importance of this uh, uh, before and the interactions between uh, uh, psychology, you know, people who are quite expert on vaccine psychology around the place, and also the sociologic implications that we've heard today, uh, particularly in our multicultural societies. So I think uh, it's really important to have that come out and, uh, uh, and be addressed and for the right advice to get to our government, which uh, I, I think by and large it is. Tony, thank you very much. Uh, any other final uh, brief comments, please, or statements? Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> I would just like to thank everyone for joining today. And Melissa, thank you for the work you're doing because to spread um, accurate knowledge to people who may not be have English as their first language is really, really key in, in increasing the vaccine uptake. And as a virologist, um, I just want to say that please think about being vaccinated because this Delta variant is very scary and very horrifying to me as a virologist. And there's also another aspect from COVID and that is what we call long COVID. So if you are infected with COVID, you can experience long COVID, which can cause you to have long-term health um, problems. So please um, do think about being vaccinated. And again, thank you everyone for contributing today. And um, thank you, Melissa, for your work, especially. Lessons from COVID today have been immense, reflective and very deep. On behalf of Westmead Institute for Medical Research, Access News Australia, I personally and professionally thank each and every one for the contribution you make to the world in which we live. And I'm absolutely delighted to call you friends and colleagues. And I do hope that interaction takes place between all of you as being beneficiaries to building a better community. Thank you for joining us today, each and every one of you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.